Um, all right, so Matthew's here. Let's just bring him on. Let's Matthew. Anthony, Hello. how are you? What's going on? This has been a long time coming, man. We've been on um, One Peter Five together. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. met at the conference, mm -hmm. but we've never actually got to like sit and hang and talk, man. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been a long time in the making. Um, do you prefer Matthew, or is it Matt okay, or is it not Matt? Uh, either one, either one don't matter. Matt's okay, okay. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Sometimes I ask people if I could say like it, a short. Anthony prefers anyway. the situation. <laughs> <laughs> we were actually just talking about um, Schneider uh, wrote a letter to Strickland, just. Giving him some moral support for being brave right now. What, what do you what do you make of that scenario? Well, it's good. Uh, you know, I would imagine if any priests, you know, are, are going through a lot, it's good to have your brother priest supporting you. And I would imagine a bishop would want to have his brother bishops also coming out to support him. But at the same time, understanding that, you know, if nobody shows up too, like you got to stick by, you know, your conscience of doing what's right for the faith too. So yeah. I mean, our Lord did the road to Calvary virtually alone. He had a little support. But sometimes you got to go out there and the martyrs, too. Sometimes they seem to be all alone. So it's good that some people like, you know, Schneider is acting like a St. Veronica, maybe in this instance, and helping him along the way. But he's got to, you know, stick to what what he really believes the Lord's calling him to. Yeah, it's it's uh, we're, I we were just saying that sometimes when somebody comes out and says something, it inspires other people to right? the mimetic desire works both ways. So it could cause cowardice or it can cause other people to finally speak up when they were feeling something, but they see somebody else do it first, then they'll follow in their lead. And I think yeah. you're starting to see a lot of people start to speak up now. Mm -hmm. That's good. Cause a lot of people aren't natural leaders. A lot of people are followers. And sometimes you just need a few people to break into the fray and say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to follow this law. I'm not going to stick with this. I'm standing up. And, and then people go, that's what, you know, Archbishop Lefebvre really did too. So yeah. he, he stood and, made a lie in the sand. And sometimes you need to do that for moral issues too in our society too. You need to say, no, I will not cross that line. And it takes sometimes a couple of people to do that. And then other people will come around you. Um, Matt, when, uh, let me hear a little bit of your, your conversion story. You don't have to tell the whole thing. Like kind of give us a little snapshot. Like when did you, did you grow up Catholic? Are you a convert? What's your, what's your story? Yeah, so um, my family, we, well, we were not religious at all until I was in high school. So we really, um, so I, my father was raised Catholic. He he kind of left the faith practice wise in um in the seventies. But uh, it was it was actually really nine eleven that kind of brought us back the the wow. turmoil from that and everything. Of course, we've we've never lived in New York. We have no connection there. So some people think you know it's only really New Yorkers are affected. But a lot of people just saw like you know things could happen. You could a whole life could be taken away at any moment. And you know my family kind of looked how, at that how too. old were you when nine eleven happened. I was like eleven or twelve. Okay, so you're you're, you're my age. Yeah. yeah. Um. So okay, so your parents, your your parent. Now, was your mom Catholic? No, she was never Catholic. She grew up in a in a family that was very anti-Catholic. When she was mm. growing up, um, her mom actually forbid her to play with anybody in the neighborhood who was Catholic. You were not allowed <laughs> to play with neighbors who were Catholic. That was the rule. If only Catholics had that kind of conviction. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, they were actually. So when she actually uh, told uh, my grandparents that she was becoming Catholic, too, they did not speak to her for about three years. Wow. So you're 12. Now, were you already baptized? And no, were you no I was not. So, so I was. Yeah, I was, entered the church um, in 2004. Now, did you go through catechism or did you just go through RCIA at that age? Uh, it was an RCIA class. That's what, yeah, that's what I figured. Because when you miss your first communion and stuff and all that, they, they usually will just put you through an RCIA class. Yes, so exactly. now, did, did, are, were you taking your faith seriously or kind of just following your parents' lead? Oh, no, I definitely took it very seriously. It was very meaningful to me. And looking now, I'm I'm like a big impetus. You know, I try to be for trying to get everybody in my family who to go to mass every Sunday. Some people are like, ah, you know, we'll just skip this week. No, we can't skip a week. You know, you got to go yeah. check on people, encourage them. So I do, you know, try to do what I can to really, and same thing with my, you know, my, um, my dad's mom, who was always Catholic. Uh, my grandma, I try to, you know, encourage her to go to, cause she's kind of like, I'm old. I don't, I don't feel like driving. And, you know, sometimes you got to do what you have to do. So no, I, I think it really was the Holy ghost um, inspiring me. Cause I think it had a big impact on my family too. 
That's cool. So, all right. So you start taking your faith seriously at that young age. Now, what, what leads you, like, when's your first experience of more traditional leaning Catholicism? Because I know, like, it was actually during that RCIA program. I, online, actually, I attribute a lot of what I learned to the faith, not to in-person RCIA, which I think it was very flawed in some respect. Of course, it had kernels of truth to it. That's actually one of the reasons I got so involved in catechesis and helping out the like the catechism class.com programs I'm affiliated with and such is I see the need for strong catechetical programs like RCA and such to really fill the need that so many superficial programs out there are doing right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I know some traditionalists don't like RCA, but I think they don't like what RCA in practice is. If it's just, if you're thinking about it as a means to bring people into the faith, to properly catechize them and enter the church, which I think of RCA, not necessarily these certain experiences you might had or I had, I, I think they can be very meaningful, especially if they are traditional. But it was during that time I I was going online and, you know, I spent a lot of time on the Fish Eaters website, of which I owe yeah. a great uh, debt to, to teaching me like what Catholic culture really was, what it meant to be Catholic and the forums there. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the traditional mass. And my family even had a neighbor down the road who we started talking to more that time. And uh, it turns out his dad recently died. And he's like, I, I know you guys are becoming Catholic. And um, he has these, you know, Catholic VHSs, you know, we're, we don't not going to use them anymore. You guys want them. So we, we I know we put one in and it was actually one of those old videos of a traditional Latin mass filmed in uh, like, I think, in, in, somewhere in England in 1997. Uh, and wow. it's, it's, it's kind of popular in the track community. That was one of the first ones. So watching is beautiful. And uh, ever since, you know, kind of then and what I learned, like, that's what I wanted to do. And I really had that conviction. Uh, but it wasn't until my first year of college I was able to to go to a traditional mass. So, OK, this is this is so cool. Um, so now as you're coming into tradition, because I we were at that conference, you gave such an amazing talk. Oh, and I like I I'm. We wanted to actually get you on for St. Michael's Lent, and mm -hmm. the scheduling didn't work out. Um, and I wanted to do St. Michael's Lent, but I, I wanted to understand it first. So we're going to wind up bringing you back on for St. Martin's Lent, but I want to do St. Martin's Lent this year. Like, when did you start learning about all these traditions that that we've completely lost? Because these are the things, like, mm -hmm. even, and we really brought you on to talk about Ember Days today, because I think a lot of us are afraid to fast. I mean, we had our, our telegram today. Some people, some of the people were saying like, I'm terrible at fasting. I don't, but there's, there's gotta be a way to just get started. And to some people say you're terrible at praying too. It doesn't mean you don't pray. It means you learn how to pray better. You put time and effort into it. You know, like yeah. I run marathons for fun. You can't be like, uh, you know, I, I went out there and I tried to run it and I failed. So it must not be for me, you know, like, you yeah. know, the same thing like don't try to be like i'm going to adopt all the traditional fasting days off the bat no let's you know start to do uh, a few of them um that's um that really makes a big difference so i mean i wrote about it in my book the definitive guide to catholic fasting and absence this is the book i talked a little bit about at the conference and i'm actually working on a second edition right now because there's so many questions i wanted to even delve deeper really into understanding because the first one was so much about our history as Americans, what we lost and was really stolen from us, not in 1962, you know, not in 1950, but consistently over the generations, how to bring it back. And the second edition is going to be uh, so many other countries had the same thing. The Hispanic world, the Philippines, the French, they all just kind of wanted to whittle away this down. So it doesn't matter really where you're at right now, you can incorporate more fasting. And one of the really um one of the really uh you know inspiring things for me when i became catholic was lent and and friday absence and people care so much they're willing to forgo certain things certain times of the year that to me was a huge draw so like i can't imagine uh wanting to be catholic if had there not been lent i remember how invigorating that practice was and friday abstinence year round of course as i learned from fish eaters and how much i rely on that and then over time i realized well and I've probably been doing St. Martin's Lent now for probably about six or seven years. Um, but when you understand these things, you understand like some of this was practiced for centuries under penalty of sin. Not like, you know, yeah. it'd be great if you can do this. It'd be great for your spiritual life. No, like if you don't do this, you sin. You know, and we as a whole Catholic community around the world are doing this. And when that has been robbed and taken away and hidden and we don't know about it anymore, we've lost a part of our heritage. 
something when that you, our forefathers in heaven knew and loved and we don't know, know about. When you read the 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 popes, like uh, the popes before our time, it's almost like they speak about fasting as if every Catholic should just under, understand it. They don't, they don't, it's almost as if when they say it, they just assume, you know, this is just what you should be doing. And part of the reason there are so few conversions now are because so few people fast, so few Catholics are fasting. My favorite liturgical time of the year is Advent now. It never was. I used to love Advent, right? And mm -hmm. I'm sorry, did I say Advent? I, my favorite mm -hmm. time is Lent. But mm. It used to be Advent because you love Christmas and you love all that mm -hmm. stuff. But Lent, there's something so amazing about Lent for me now because no matter where I am in my life, in my spiritual life, Lent is like that boot camp that gets me back it on is. track and it and it sets me right. And I'm I I really get excited for it as it's coming up. Mm -hmm. So as we're coming up on St. Martin's Lent this year, I want to get as excited for that as I do for regular Lent. Because when you observe a fast like this, the end, the finish line is truly rewarding. There's a reason that studies done before the 60s would poll Americans, what are your favorite holidays? Easter was easily always in the top three. Yeah. Easter's no longer in the top three. When you're not fasting all these days, you're not looking forward to it as such. Now, you know, you got things like Halloween in the top three. You know, before it was Christmas and Easter, usually, and then Thanksgiving, you know, but when you're preparing so much and when you fast leading up to Christmas too, and you have to forego these, you know, these different Christmas parties, which shouldn't be in Advent anyway, and you have to do some sort of spirit of mortification during this time, it really makes you look forward to Christmas more and midnight mass all the more, you know, when you really prepare things. And there's so many intricacies the fasting world teaches us, like even Christmas Eve was a mandatory day of fasting and abstinence until the night. 1960s so i mean that's why the italians have the feast of seven fishes because it was mm -hmm. a day of absence that's why so many people in eastern europe had that as well and there was even so much concern like so you're probably aware that before uh you know the time of of pope pius the 12th the eucharistic fast was no food and no water from midnight until mm -hmm. the time of holy communion and that went back really to apostolic times. The apostles themselves really, uh, the early church instituted that. And I talk about that in the book in the whole chapter. Um, but a lot of moral theologians taught about, well, you can observe the spirit of the rule. So, you know, you're celebrating Christmas Eve. You finally have that dinner. It's a fasting day. But at what time should you stop having that dinner? Because if you go to mass at midnight, you could, you could potentially have dinner till 1159. And then you go to Mass, and then you would receive Holy Communion shortly after, and that defied the spirit of the fast, but not the letter of the law. So there were even documents put out that make sure your dinner ends by 8 p.m., so you fast at least four hours. Not because that was the rule, but because that was the spirit. And fasting questions like this were so pertinent that theologians would talk about it, priests would talk about it, people would ask counsel about it all the time. Like my book will go over things like chocolate. Is it a liquid or a solid? And you might think that's, you know, a flipping <laughs> question, but in certain cultures, it was very serious because at yeah. room temperature, my, my chocolate is a liquid, but I froze it into solid. Can I eat it or not? Can I drink it? And the similar question, what does it mean to be a liquid? Does it mean you drink it? Does it mean it has to have no calories? Does it mean they have a certain amount of calories? Those were all answered in former times, things people don't think about whatsoever now. But it shows you so much thought was put into observing the letter and the spirit, especially when you consider. So I put together a calendar for my a Catholic Life website, and it's mentioned in the book as well. There were roughly two thirds of the year you could not eat meat. And there were roughly one third of the year was a fasting day. So that used to be required. And that doesn't include like St. Michael's Lent here. That's not other devotions. Yeah things right I, I know rob wants to ask a question so i'm going to let him ask and then i want to and then i want to say something real quick i actually didn't have a question <laughs> oh i look like you were trying to jump in so uh all right so aaron our friend aaron is a protestant he's been very curious checking out a lot of catholic channels and stuff so i mean you're talking we there are people that watch this show that really don't even maybe they don't even understand the purpose of fasting i mean they mm -hmm. know it's in scripture jesus says some things can only be uh solved by prayer and fasting yeah, so what demons is, can only be driven out by prayer driven out by prayer and fasting so what is what can what can we get what can we do as people that are just starting out that really don't know much about it what 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 can we really give people as inspiration and maybe try to make a little bit of a change in their daily life 
Well, I think we got to start by, you know, history. History's on our side here. If you look at what did the early church do, they knew and practiced fasting, really in two concrete forms, devotional fasts of every week. So Wednesdays and Fridays were days of fasting and abstinence. And some places like Rome added Saturdays as well. So those those yeah. were the days throughout the whole year you would, why would uh, fast and abstain. For those who might not know, why would those day be be devotional fast? Well, well, uh, Fridays, of course, because that's the day in which Christ died on the cross. Wednesday, because that was the day in which he was betrayed. And then Saturday, because that was the day he lied, uh, lie in the tomb dead and his mother was grieving for him. So and all the, all, all the apostles themselves grieve. So those are the days of penance throughout the year. But more than that, the apostles themselves instituted Lent. More than one church historian say Lent was instituted by the apostles. And um, they say that our Lord himself did not institute the Lenten fast because he wanted to give the church some discretion. You know, the church is the keys to bind uh, and to loose. But, you know, they instituted very early on and it was kept since these ancient times. Some other days were added, though, very early on. And if we study what, you know, you can study how fasting was practiced and you can go over a lot of things. But, you know, basically it comes down to, as St. Thomas Aquinas thought, fasting was done for a couple things. One, to to bridle uh, our flesh, to really increase temperance in us, to make restitution for sin as well, and then to raise your mind to contemplate heavenly things. So if you think about so many people now say they don't have time for prayer or they can't focus in prayer. I mean, if you were fasting more, you don't have time for lunch. You know, there's no lunch. You don't have breakfast. Those are extra prayer times you could have in the day. The mental clarity you develop. I mean, I even go over in the second edition of the book that I'm working on so many physical benefits that um, physicians and studies have shown uh, mental benefits for clarity as well, as well as physical benefits against ailments. So there's so much you can benefit from. So allowing yourself to understand what our forefathers did in practice has immense benefits to us. But in addition to the fast I mentioned, Ember Days, what we're going to talk about today, is very ancient as well. I mean, St. Leo the Great says he thought it was an apostolic institution himself. But we know that uh, it at least goes back to Pope Callistus, who reigned in the 220s. So it's at least that old. Now, Ember Days are are based on a, a Jewish tradition, right? Um, yes. Yeah, so some people would say, actually, that Ember Days ultimately go back to the Old Testament. So the prophet Zacharias talked about fasting at different times throughout the year. So that would be the fourth, fifth, seventh and tenth months of the year. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. And the church appropriated those times and really consecrated those to God in the Christian context of using those times to thank God for the fruits of the earth. And, and to and to bless the uh, you know the, what we cultivate, but also very importantly, and this really distinguishes them from rogation days, is that these days are also set aside to pray for priests and pray for those being ordained. So much so that uh, Ember Saturdays were the privileged days for priestly ordination for a long time. As even mentioned in the 1917 Code of Canon Law, basically you need to ordain priests on Ember Saturdays, really unless a grave reason. Um, uh, you know, warrant something otherwise. Bishop consecrations take place on Sundays or Feasts of the Apostles, but priestly ordinations are Ember Saturdays. I never heard of Ember Days until 2017, 2018. I never even heard of them before that until I started going to the traditional Mass. Once I started going to the traditional Mass, I started hearing about them. So the, a couple of years back, um, Eric Sammons and Taylor Marshall had a conversation and it kind of changed my whole understanding of what it means to be Catholic because our whole lives should be on this rhythm of fast, fast feast. It shouldn't yes. be, it shouldn't be just at Lent that we give a chocolate up or anything. It should be throughout your entire life. You should be fasting and saving Sundays as a feast day. You should like really your whole week should be depriving yourself a little bit. And that was always mm -hmm. so daunting to me. But Eric actually had said, look, if you're if you're having a hard time fasting, try starting off with just not having your breakfast until a few hours later or skip breakfast. Yes. Totally. Like that. I actually find that to be fantastic advice. So I find that as soon as you start to eat, it's going to increase your metabolism. You're going to be hungry mm -hmm. if you can delay that. So, you know, they say now two small meals and one big, one large meal is, is a fast it's in the, in the real context of of um, fasting, you would call the morning thing a frustulum, the evening snack, a collation, and a meal in between. Um, 
But the thing is, you don't have to have those. If you forsake those and just wait to have your meal later, it's going to be much easier, I feel like, because it's amazing how long one can go without eating. But if you eat that little something, you're going to want more. Best to forego it. Great advice. Yeah. So th that was the first thing that helped. The other thing was people don't realize that the stomach is the root of other vices. So um, uh, M, M Proximus just actually said, so I just quit smoking, right? I've smoked for 27 hmm. years. Um, so he actually said, ant fasting will help you doing that other thing. And he's right. Because I think he means the sugar thing too. Oh, the sugar thing too. But it's really even the smoking. Or if you're struggling, a lot of guys are struggling with crap on the internet. If you have a vice that you're trying to root out of your life, getting to the stomach, the stomach is the, yes. the root of every other Thomas vice. Thomas Aquinas and other saints of that era said the best cure for sins, especially against temptations for purity, was fasting. Fasting yeah. more. That is the the remedy for that. So it is. Um, it's not just depriving yourself of chocolate. If you look at what did the early Christians do in fasting? One meal after sunset, it was a vegan meal. Um, so until the mid 1700s, by definition, if it was a fasting day, meat was not to be had. So there was no yeah. exception to that. So, but in the early church, it was even vegan. Fish wasn't allowed until about the year 600. So basically, like that, that's what they did. They forgo that snack, waited till the evening, had their meal. They wouldn't even have water during the day until their meal. So it's really quite something when people now think a fast can be substituted with giving up chocolate, or you hear people say, I'm on a media fast and not going to have TV. Well, if you have struggled with TV, you should probably give it up too, but that doesn't replace a fast. A fast, it has to be with food. You're subjecting your body to that. So actually, yeah. I mean, I've even heard from priests and seminarians that they were replacing some fasting with media fast. And that's really absurd. You know, that if you want to do that in addition as extra penance, that's fine, probably meritorious, but it does not replace the physical harm one needs to do to themselves. You know, our Lord said the kingdom of heaven is won by violence and the violent yeah. bear the way. And he referred to the violence as the violence we do ourselves in penance, not the violence you inflict on others. The violence of penance is how you win heaven. Yeah, I think we're all going to be held to account for all the complaining we do about bad clergy, for all the complaining we do about the state of the church. We're every one of us are going to have to answer for the little sacrifices we were unwilling to give up. Like these things that we're unwilling to give up, we are we bear some of the responsibility of the sins that are in the church because what happens to one member mm -hmm. it affects the entire church. Mm -hmm. And you have a means, if you're in the state of grace, to offer a fasting to repair those sins. And I do feel like those people who go throughout their day without making a morning offering to offering up their day, including their fasting in restitution for sin and to prevent future sins, they are complicit. Yeah, that's a, that's a rough one to think about, guys. And so that's why I think Ember Days is such an important one, because we're all saying how much we want holy clergy. So. What is what is the traditional um like what is a traditional ember day fast? Is it just a day of abstinence or is it a day of fasting and abstinence? What, it is what fasting and abstinence. So I mean, um actually it was relative. So you probably heard that, you know, nowadays um Ember Wednesdays and Ember Saturdays are considered partial abstinence in the 1962 calendar. Partial mm -hmm. abstinence was invented in 1741 by Pope Benedict the Fourth, um uh by um but Pope Benedict the Fourteenth, yeah, and um, it was really he would just acquiesce into the um, demands of the modern world, who were like, we we need you know have meat during Lent, you know. So he gave in and allowed uh, you know certain days uh, during Lent, during weekdays, uh, of course not Fridays though, and never Saturdays either, as days where meat could be had at the main meal, but not at the frustulum snack or the collation snack. <clears throat> but that's where it came. But Ember days themselves remained as days of complete abstinence until January 28th of 1949. So that day, the U.S. bishops got permission that the Wednesdays and Saturdays of Ember Days, you could have meat at your main meal. But before then, before 1949, it was really unheard of. So that's really how far back it goes. So if it's an Ember Day, it is a day of abstinence. And it's also a fast, which means you can only have one meal, and you really should forego those frustulum and collation if you can. There was actually... Even at the end of the 1800s, the Baltimore Council, the plenary council in Baltimore, they even released manuals to tell people, like, if you're weighing your snack, make sure it doesn't weigh too much. You know, how many ounces should it be? Because if it's too much of this, it's, it's going to be too much like a meal. 
uh, the, the thought of that is rather uh, is completely foreign to Catholics now that, you know, your snack should even be weighed to make sure that you're not violating the fast in the letter yeah. or in the spirit. So you come so far. So Ember Day should be days of fasting. They should be days of absence. They should be days of increased prayer, though, especially offering that up for blessing of the fruits of the earth, as well as offering it up for clergy. You know, especially those maybe a lot of dioceses now no longer ordain on Ember Saturdays, but we can at least offer it up for priests who are recently ordained or soon to be ordained, it priests, you know, anybody in that season. Um, yeah. So so, so there's certainly a lot of merit uh, to be had for that. But but there's also some other things, you know, that I think is doing it just, you know, having the right mindset. And uh, part of that comes down to, and I read this online, that we can have different focuses of thanking God for certain particular fruits of the earth at each season. So for instance, this one website said these upcoming Ember Days. So these are the autumnal Ember Days, also called the Michael Mass Ember Days. Um, they occur after the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross. And this would be the ideal Ember Days to give thanks to God for grapes that are used to make the precious blood of Christ. So that's something we might want to be in particular thankful for. And it relates really well because we just celebrated the Feast of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary on September 8th, the traditional day to bless grapes and the grape harvest. So there's a reason like when we're we don't even do these people, things anymore. This is so crazy. Yeah. Yeah. But the uh, same thing like the, the winter ember days, the traditional days to give thanks to God for olive oil that he will use to make the holy oils for unction or in spring, giving thanks to God for the flowers and the bees that are used to make the blessed candles that will be used for baptisms mm -hmm. in an upcoming Easter and summer to thank God for, for wheat that he uses and allows to be turned into the Eucharistic host, which becomes our Lord himself. So it has a different mindset when you try to, you know, be conscious of this, I think. Uh, what state do you live in? I live in Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Oh, so it was easy for you to get to that conference. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> All right. So now for St. Martin's Lent, that starts on uh, on November 11th, right? Um, yeah, uh, well, November well, 11th is Martin Mass. Martin so uh, St. Martin's Lent would start November 12th, the feast of the day um, after. Yeah. Oh, so we would have his feast day, and then the following days begins the Lent. Yes, Martin Mass is really the, the Catholic Thanksgiving. I wrote an article on this before. Uh, I, I write for the Fatima Center for Catholic Family News, 1 Peter 5. I think I've addressed it maybe in all over the years. But Martin Mass is a very important day. It's the Catholic Thanksgiving. So, I mean, if it's not a Friday or Saturday, um, one would have goose. That's traditional mm -hmm. food to have. You would actually walk around with your children with lanterns at night. And these lanterns were to symbolize your charity, like the charity of St. Martin who took off his cloak and cut it in half and gave it to a beggar. And that was actually Christ in disguise. So that's a symbolize that. So in Catholic cultures, there were parades. There was great celebration. This was to be great charity uh, of this. And it would be a day of merriment before the fast. And unfortunately, um, uh, you know, that's obviously when World War I ended, November 11th. So Armistice Day. And some people speculate that, um, you know, Woodrow Wilson made that a holiday and all. And he put a lot into, into that holiday. And people speculate uh, because he was a Freemason, he was very anti-Catholic as a Protestant, that he kind of wanted to obscure the last remnants of Martin Mass in America because these Catholics were out there celebrating and he did not want to have any Catholic celebration. So don't know if that's true or not, but it is important to realize that it is Martin Mass. So in addition to honoring and praying for those who died in World War I, we should remember the charity of St. Martin, who himself was an officer, who did all this charity while still a catechumen, who went on to become a bishop and do, do so much for the faith that that um, before we enter into this next fast, we should thank God. Like you talked about the feasts and fasts, you know, throughout the year when one has fasts, so one can have feasts. If you don't have fasts, you can't have feasts. Yeah. And that, now does it run right through Advent and takes you right to Christmas? Correct. And is it just Lent? Like, would you just do what you would normally do during Lent? Or is there any special? No, no, it definitely had a different character. I talk about in the book, the Lenten fast is the totally different. It is the most strict. When you were talking about Sundays being special days, that's true, except there is some caveats for Lent. Because in uh, the Lent's, uh, the Sundays of Lent are still days of absence, traditionally. People might be shocked. Nobody's taught about it. But really, until the end of the 1800s, really around the time of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, Sundays in Lent were mandatory days of absence. I've written articles on it showing historical evidence that's clear. You could not have meat during Lent on Sundays. 
And yeah, I, traditionally, I think, all of Lent was vegan. Say yeah. Martin's Lent was not vegetarian, but but the Lenten fast was vegan, and it even included I, Sunday. I had a lot of people get upset with me last Lent when I when I said, "Look, I, if you give something up specifically for Lent, Sunday is not a day to go back to get, doing that thing. It just means you don't have to fast on Sunday. But if you gave right. something up for Lent, you shouldn't go yeah. back and have that thing on Sunday because you're not is still actually penance." Correct, yes. right? So it's Lent, and Lent is so like a marathon, and Sundays are like an aid station, a day without fasting. It doesn't mean the race is over, it doesn't mean you're not, you're still going. You know, Sunday yeah. is still a day. Actually, Sunday, I mean, you're not fasting during Sundays of Lent. Sun, uh, fasting on Sundays would not be appropriate, um, but it's certainly a day of increased prayer. You know, it's certainly a day you could do penance. You know, so if some some people might say it even is inappropriate to pray the stations and the cross on Sundays during Lent, and that's simply false. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with meditating and doing penance and praying about certain uh, aspect of our Lord's life. Um, that's, so um, so Aaron's asking, abs yeah, so a, a day of abstinence, Aaron, would be a day where you forego meat. Is there anything else we give up or is it just meat? Well, except for Lent. Uh, we'll, t we'll talk about Lent in a second. Absence refers to no flesh meat. So the meat right. of a mammal or a bird. Uh, it, it permits, and this, well, I mean, the early church was a little different, uh, but after 600, it permitted fish. So fish became okay. Around the 11th century, shellfish became permitted. Um, but generally speaking, when we say abstinence for hundreds of years, we mean no flesh meat of mammals or fowl. So meat. Uh, but that's why fish is, uh, is allowed. Alligators allow because it's cold-blooded animal, you know, so things like that that might surprise people. A amphibian, snake, that would be allowed. That would not be meat in this context. Um, yeah. But during Lent, traditionally Lent was vegan. So no fish during Lent, no eggs during Lent, no cheese during Lent. That's why you have Easter eggs. That's why you have all these customs that are associated with it, with, with dairy and all. People would have to throw them away and get rid of them. Um, Look like uh, pancakes on Fat Tuesday. Exactly. To get rid of your, your milk and your eggs and all of that. Exactly. And same thing yeah. with um, potchkes in the Polish. Wait, Polish let's, let's talk about that for a second because people don't understand what. Okay, so Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras. Is I tried to explain this to my kids. They didn't. They had no idea. I'm like, uh, like the idea of Mardi Gras is you're you're not going out to party and get drunk and have a party. You're using up the things that you won't eat during. You know what Lent. Mardi Gras means, right? Mardi Gras. I talk about it in my book. The actual word Mardi Gras is derived from the literal words "farewell to meat." Uh, that's no, what carnival I didn't means. Know that. So Mardi Gras carnival, carnival, carnivale, means yeah. going okay. away. So that's really, you know, what it relates to. So when we talk about, oh, I'm going out to the carnival on, on Mardi Gras, you're saying goodbye to meat. So it's all mm -hmm. about using that up. So you're totally right. It's not just a, a day of debauchery, which is actually abhorrent, which is yeah. why there is uh, certainly in, in New Orleans, that is the day that we celebrate the votive feast of our Lord Jesus Christ to form in his passion that is set on that day. That's also where we have the 40-hour devotion. Uh, that was instituted to make reparation to God for the sins of Mardi Gras. It started because of sins against Mardi Gras. But I think that those who are actually observing an authentic Lent, a Lent of without dairy, without meat, fasting, prayer, and penance, um, Mardi Gras can be, can be celebrated. And it should be in the context of, let's go out, let's have that final steak dinner, let's have eggs for breakfast, you know, have that you know, glass of milk or that latte, because you're not going to have any of these soon. And yeah. then being thankful to God for these, uh, but then we're getting rid of them. That's what Mardi Gras should be, not a debaucherous show. Now, one one big question I've heard argued back and forth among trads especially is, does coffee break a fast? If it's black, black coffee, cream and sugar. Co coffee would not traditionally break the fast. And I and as talked about in the book too, because that would be liquid. Liquids are permitted. And what do theologians say? What does it mean to be liquid? Doesn't mean you just drink it, because by that logic, you know, you could puree up your steak and drink it and you say it's a liquid. No, it's not. It's obviously not a liquid. What does it mean to be a liquid? It means one must drink it and not chew it, but it also means it has to aid in digestion. And three, it has to have virtually no nutritional value. So they didn't okay. use the word calories back then because they didn't know about calories, but black coffee, you know, virtually no calories. AIDS and digestion, you drink it, unquestionably black coffee is allowed. And that's actually been said by the Holy See multiple times 
it was allowed. Um, Everybody's so relieved. <laughs> Whereas opposed to some juices that are made from heavy puree would literally violate the fast even now mm. because some people also think, oh, I'll have a smoothie. You know, you know, yeah. I'll go to Jamba Juice, have a smoothie. That smoothie might have 600 calories. That is more than <laughs> some people eat at lunch. So, you know, you cannot have that. So this concern and care for what should I have? Can I, I should just forego these things is important. And it really shows a Catholic mindset, uh, a mindset that, you know, our forefathers had as well. So, all right. So I want to try and get uh, all the people that are in our telegram and all the people that are part of our locals community. I want to get everyone that's, that actually does watch our, you know, our channel regularly to do St. Martin's Lent. Oh, so how does it, how does it differ from regular Lent? What should we be preparing ourselves for? Yes. Yeah, so I'm glad you say that. So I also run a telegram group too, for those who in the fellowship of St. Nicholas that I run with one Peter five. So if anybody yeah. wants to also join that telegram for information, we talk about fast throughout the year. It's mm-hmm. one Peter com backslash fast. And I mean, you can go down to the bottom. There's a link to the telegram group. We Probably have about 350 or so people in there who are doing these fasts throughout the year. And we have different tiers. So you can kind of ease into it and say Martin's Lent, I think is tier two and thus tier three as well. Um, so what does it consist of? It consists of every day but Sunday, and we will exempt uh, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, too, as a holy day of obligation, um, as a day of, of fasting. So one meal, one meal only, and um, that meal is, is vegetarian. Now, Sundays um, are, you know, exempt. Uh, and remember, this is not binding under a penalty of sin, too. So we're looking to what did people used to do. Um some people choose to have meat on Sundays during St. Martin's Lent. Some don't. I would say that's up to someone's preference. But the other days, no meat, one meal in the evening. Some people I know as well are choosing to give up alcohol. That might be a worthwhile sacrifice too, even though it's never been part of uh, the Lent traditionally. The other exception to I'll mention is Thanksgiving Day here in America. Um, we do try to keep that as a fasting day, uh, since most people fast until dinner anyway but allowing themselves to meet at that particular meal on Thanksgiving. So that's kind of how we structured our, uh, you know, St. Martin's Lent. Yeah. So Um, we're going to have a lot of people that are, this is probably going to be their first time doing it. And they, and they were saying how daunting they find fasting. So we'll, what we'll try to do is we'll make tiers. Yeah. And and this is my calendar too. This is, this is tier three. This is the ideal. What I try to get people to, uh, aspire to. I have made a 2024 calendar that I'm going to post on the A Catholic Life website, probably in a couple of weeks or early October, since we still have some time. Uh, I do also make available calendar files if people want to incorporate this thing, like an Outlook or a, you know, um, a Google Calendar, an Apple Calendar, or something like that too. But I oh, even just awesome. saved this, and you know, it kind of helps me understand a little bit more too about why certain days are here, what was required or, or not. And, um, you know, you don't want to get a little bit too hung up into it. You do want to live by the spirit as well, too, so especially these that don't bind under sin. Um, and, I mean, things to keep in mind, too, is during St. Martin's Lent, we're going to have the Vigil of the Immaculate Conception, uh, which in 1957, Pope Pius XII instituted as a required day of fasting, even though he had already abolished the Vigil of the Immaculate Conception a few years prior. He then subsequently made that a fasting day. Actually, it's kind of confusing why he did so, but but he did so. So we note that. We also know there's Ember Days during Advent, too. So those are going to be in red in December. You'll notice those. Christmas Eve itself also always going to so, be a day. So wait, now, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception is a fasting day? No, the Vigil. Oh, the Vigil, vigil. is. Because the Feast, vigil. I would think, is oh. a feast day, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, so... um. So a few things to know about, yes, the vigil, so the day before, St. Ambrose's feast day, which is the vigil of the Immaculate Conception, is a fasting day and a day of abstinence. Um, the Immaculate Conception would n- not be a fasting day um, in regards to St. Martin's Lent. So one thing that is worthy to know is some years, you know, people talk about this, when it falls on a Friday, is it a day of absence or not? And per the 1917 Code of Canon Law, it ceased uh, to be a day of mandatory absence on a Friday because it's a holy day of obligation. And it matters if it's a holy day of obligation in your area. So if you're in a country that does not observe that as a holy day of obligation, you would still observe absence. But the thing I like to make people aware of is that was actually quite a modern novelty. St. Pius X, when he did so, uh, actually broke tradition and went back more than a millennium. Because beforehand, if it was a Friday, 
it was always a day of absence, with the only exception being Christmas, which back to the time of St. Francis. So beforehand, if Immaculate Conception fell on a Friday, you would have to ask the Pope for a dispensation. And I have found historical mm -hmm. records of people doing this, for instance, All Saints Day in the 1800s, granted an exception, um, you would have to ask for that. You, because people, the Friday absence is so sacred and so foundational to our life as Catholics. It's almost as important as Sunday mass to people for centuries. Like the thought of eating meat on Friday was abhorrent, you know. Actually, that's why in some countries it was a crime. It really was. So when the Protestants were revolting against the Catholics, uh, Zwigli would go out and have sausage eating competitions on Fridays in Lent. It is an utter blast. And it would actually, it would revolt the, yes. a good Catholic. Yeah. Why did we stop that? That's like, like, I, I that? You know, that's the same as spitting in our Lord's face on his way to Calvary. You know, that's a, somebody oh, wow. in an opinion of authority in the church saying, we don't do this out of love for our Lord who was crucified today. And other people saying, I don't care is really what that's saying. So Paul the Sixth is the one who got rid of the Friday abstinence, right? Well, it depends what you mean by getting rid of it, because every day, really, in the per the nineteen eighty three even code of canon law, it says every Friday throughout the year is to be a day of of, of penance. So um, when he kind of when you make people have options and you think, well, you can do something else, then people feel like you don't have to do anything. So that's really the problem. It's in the nineteen eighty three code, so I would say every Friday of the year is to be kept as a day of absence, really, and. I'm glad to see some countries like England, for instance, have really uh, brought that back uh, manda and mandated it. And I actually think about it, and I'm actually going to try to see if a friend of mine can help me do this. It's actually interesting for all that, you know, Francis does to talk about the environment. Like, I'm surprised he isn't saying we just shouldn't eat meat, you know, on any Friday of the year. And here's the carbon emission, we would say. If I anticipated, that might be <laughs> one of the only silver linings coming out of him. And I haven't seen that yet, but I kind of thought I would see that coming, but I think that's maybe a little too traditional is to bring back mandatory Friday. Yeah, but out. maybe, maybe somebody should mention that to him <laughs> because it would be, a, but even our, our bishops, right? Like you would think one of, you would think a, a Bishop Strickland would come out and I mean, all these letters he's writing, let's, let's get him to write a letter on Friday after. I mean, I just think it's so few. I remember um, when I, uh, when I mentioned it on Twitter about not eating meat on a Friday, a, a Catholic, like a, a faithful Catholic was like, why are you not eating meat today? It's not Lent. Like it, it, the average Catholic does not even know we shouldn't be eating meat right, on Fridays. Right. And I actually, I mean, a lot of, a lot of Catholics raised, you know, in, in Catholic schools, even don't know everything. I had somebody once some years ago, tell me Ember days weren't a thing. And I'm like, well, why aren't they a thing? I mean, obviously I know a lot about them. And, uh, and she said, well, I went to Catholic school for 12 years and nobody mentioned them. If they were a thing, I would have heard about them. So that kind of hubris to think that I must have known everything to think the faith is so superficial. You could simply glean it. Like, do you go through, you know, all of um, all of your schooling and now think, well, I had history class every year. I know all history. There is nothing else yeah, I can right? possibly <laughs> know. I'm a master in history. I'm a master in every subject in English. You know, you cannot possibly teach me a word because I've had it's, English. You know, it's St. Thomas writes his whole summa and and says it's like straw and yet someone yeah. will go to a catholic school for 12 years and think they know everything yeah i mean there's we, so much even i do so while the places i write for i spend so much time trying to learn and thus share you know what i learned and so many interesting things even something to mention for today it's the feast of the exaltation holy cross and i wrote an article for the fatima center um i think it was a little bit earlier this year and actually used saint thomas aquinas and the question was if you see a relic of the true cross, what worship do we owe the relic? What worship do we would do we owe the cross? And the answer per St. Thomas was actually Latria. Latria we would yeah. literally worship the wood of the cross. Um, and some people are surprised by that. And I had some people too read it say that can't be right. I would I would I never learned that. Maybe it should be, you know, it's the means of our salvation. Me. Yes. So I mean our Lord Himself, when He will appear at the end of the world. It is said that all these fragments of the true cross that spread the world will be reunited and he will have his cross back. Um, it's integrally tied to him, but also it, it's just covered in his blood. You know, his blood seeped through the entire cross. So when you see a relic of the true cross, it's really like, um, you know, being in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament in a sense, because, I mean, God himself literally stained that with his blood. That is why traditionally in the church's rubrics, if there's a relic of the true cross and a priest comes in, he actually is told he needs to genuflect to that at the start of mass, an unusual relic. And there's actually a whole 
um, series of mass said in the presence of the relic of the true cross and how it's a little bit different. Something that I found in an Irish ecclesiastical review published about 150 years ago. Again, something like that obscure. I like that stuff because it's important to make people aware of things now that have gone out of print and people aren't taught anymore. That I find a lot of that occurred with fasting when this was weeded away, even, even to Americans, you know. Saturdays were days of mandatory absence for American Catholics until um, the early 1800s. I think it was around the 1830s. Mandatory all year round on Saturday because that was the day Christ was dead in the tomb. But, you know, that went out the window and now nobody remembers that whatsoever because that generation is long since gone. We started off reading an article by Schneider talking, uh, of quoting St. Basil, who said the children should be compassionated the most because they do not even know what they have lost. That's mm -hmm. really where we're at right now. Like, we don't even know what we have lost. Matt, would, uh, do, do you write full time? Is that your gig? You're a full time writer or? Um, well, that's one of my jobs. So um, professionally, I'm a CPA. So I so I am an accountant as well. Uh, I take on clients. Uh, and uh, but then I also oversee catechismclass.com. So people who want good, sound, traditional catechesis, whether adults or children. Um, I spend a lot of time with catechismclass.com and help people convert, help people study for their sacraments, uh, help people, you know, take classes because they feel like I'm missing something here. I need to learn a bit more about the faith, yeah. really want to delve into it. So, I mean, I do all three things. So I we chose fashion to talk to you about because that's the, the talk you gave in in. Uh, at the conference, but I'm going to actually, I want to talk to you off, off air and see if there's some other things that maybe you could teach us of the of traditions we've lost, things like that. So, because I, I feel like there's so many things that, that have just been forgotten and it's there just, are. I'm, I'm going to be working maybe one day, God willing on another book too on a, so I've spent a lot of time in fasting now, but I'm a big into feast and fast. So as you talked mm -hmm. about, so I mean, the fast is lost, but the feast is lost as well. And what I mean by that is we used to have 36 holy days of obligation as of the list published in 1642. And if you go back um, to the 1200s, it was 45 days in addition to one's one's patron. So the patron saint of your diocese, of your nation, of your parish, those are holy days of obligation for you, too. So you lose all that, too. And you lose so many days of devotion. So there's so much else that has been lost, too. So you lose I, we, these fasting days, you lose these feasting days, too. We have a few questions that that I want to make sure we get to. Rob, go ahead. So, what about beavers and capybaras? I know, you know for that's instance, a very good question. I literally was researching that today, and actually, because I'm working on the second issue of my book, I have a whole section devoted to beavers, capybara, and muskrat and puffin. Puffin. Oh, the bird puff. Okay. The, yeah, puffin's actually one of the earliest ones. It was right around the. 1698, a monastery in, uh, uh, it was a Benedictine in northern France. Uh, the priest there said people in the monastery could start eating puffin on, on Fridays. And actually, it was such controversy. The archbishop intervened, and he he published a letter, you know, condemning the practice. And then he actually decided to do a thorough investigation. He had medical examiners from the College of the Archdiocese go out and study the birds and visit the priest. And he ultimately determined, and this will kind of answer the question for all these animals, is he said, well, these animals spend almost all their times in the water, so they're virtually aquatic. So by our authority, we'll allow them. And the same thing can be said for beavers, too. So um, this actually goes back to Quebec. You know, uh, the Archbishop of Quebec, Quebec sent a letter to Paris and asked beavers, you know, these animals, I'm describing them, they spend all their time, you know, in the water. You know, can we eat them? And basically it came back, yes, you know, we'll consider them aquatic um, and that actually, though, was practiced in Europe to some extent as well. Uh, but actually in Europe for, for several centuries, it was agreed that only the tail could be eaten because the tail was the element mostly in water. And actually St. Albert the Great in one letter said to eat the whole beaver would be an abomination on a day of absence, but to eat the tail would be permissible. And Cabibar as well, uh, a large rodent also uh, degrees. They spend almost all their time in in water, so for those particular people, those could could be eaten too. So the thing to know it is a lot of different areas got different exceptions to absence or fasting. So nowadays we think, oh, uh, does everybody in the world have the same you know fasting and absence? We have hardly anything left, so it seems they do. But there were so many different regional differences, even even throughout the century. We'll talk about this in the book. If you were a Native American, you had different days than I did. 
uh, because you were granted exceptions due to your physically demanding lifestyle. And if you were in the Philippines and you, one of your parents was a native and one was a Spaniard, you had different days too. So there was a whole difference, even diocese by diocese. If I was in, a, in an English colony in America and you were in a Spanish colony and you, and you were in a French one and now we're in New America, each of our dioceses, we have different days of holy days of obligations and different days of fasting. And yeah. that really wasn't unified in America until 1885. So some of these exceptions started in certain particular areas and thus kind of went there. And Spain has its whole history, too. So that's really what it comes down to. So maybe not everybody could necessarily have eaten beaver, but an exception was at least granted definitively to Quebec. Same thing with South America for, for Capybara. It wasn't like they were then shipping Capybara to Europe and saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we found a loophole, guys. We're going to send yeah. you something. <laughs> uh Shelly says, this may be a silly question, but can those of us who are still Protestant join your fast? Of course. I mean, there's nothing preventing anybody from joining the fast. So, I mean, I think it would be yeah. quite meritorious for everybody to, to practice it. And of course, um, the fasting which we practice, which our Lord himself instituted, really, because he was, you know, the example par excellence. He went in the desert and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and ate nothing uh it is believed and of course he's god so he could sustain himself but he obviously felt human hunger in a really remarkable way but so many of the saints very early on in the church long before the protestant you know reformation i mean fasting was practiced extremely uh particularly so everybody is called to to imitate what the early christians do and that's what i'm trying to give more people do to not just the minimum but what did our forefathers do in love and and how do you how do you practice that and if, even if you look at the rule of St. Benedict, St. Benedict obviously lived long before the Protestants as well. And one of the, um, you know, parts of his rule is he said the monks should love fasting, not yeah. tolerate it, not get by, not do good, you know, no good, but to love it. And you really think about that. And, um, you know, St. Albert DeVoe, he wrote a great book on, uh, uh, on the fasting, you know, to love fasting. And he said to love fasting, one must experience it. And to, to experience it, you, you have to, to love it. So it's really, you know, the ability of experiencing it and loving it. And you might think it's hard. Why would I love fasting? But as somebody now who has done fasting for, for several years, uh, at, at least, and tried to do more and try to get people more into it, it, I genuinely look forward to the next fast because it's an actual means I have of making restitution, of clearing my mind, of saving time, of restoring my body, of being part of a community united in the same cause. There's so much. So anybody uh, who's listening, no matter who you are, you certainly can join this and should join this for that unity and that clarity and to be really truly united. To, to Shelly and Aaron, <clears throat> like it's funny because I don't think you guys realize, you guys are looking in on Catholic content and I don't think you guys realize how little Catholics know about their own traditions. So you guys are actually sitting in as we're learning about our own traditions that were stolen from us. And it's not just... It started with uh, the with the Protestant revolt, of course, but over time, just modernism has crept into every facet of Christian life, and it has robbed us of our traditions and our birthright and all these things that if you go back through the Christian story and you look back into Christian history, these were things that were just so intuitive to Catholics over the centuries. It's why the church was able to de like defeat paganism in every place they went. And because we stopped all these traditions, especially of fasting, I think that's why you're seeing a rise of these ancient gods coming back again. Mm -hmm. uh, what else we got? Once again, does fasting begin on the calendar day or the liturgical day? Which would be at like Vespers, right? In, in the Roman church is always going to be the calendar day. So some in the East would start certain fasts as Vespers and such, but the, the fast that's uh, stipulated in canon law, even back in the 1970 code of canon law, is, is going to be the, the calendar day we're referring to. And Aaron, I think somebody else asked the question about, yeah, why are they called Ember Days? I think I've seen I yep. flashed that a few times, but I wanted to answer that. So that's actually kind of interesting. It brings up an interesting story. So, uh, ember days is, is an English term, but if, if you're referring to it in Latin, ember days are actually quanta tempora, or literally translated as four times, okay? So uh, obviously they occur for uh, three different days, but four times throughout the year. And somewhere throughout the centuries, the Latin word tempora 
became uh, ember in colloquial speech. And those ember days is why they enter into, um, uh, into English. But what's interesting is even the cultural significance of Ember Days that I'm talking about in my book and my writings, too, is, for instance, you might know the dish uh, shrimp tempura, you know, a very popular yeah. dish maybe in Japan. Um, it's Portuguese, That was right? instituted because of Ember Days, because they're eating these food on the quantum tempura. You know, let's let's fry up, uh, you know, these these fish that, that we can eat have this day. That's why they call them tempura. So we, we use that now to determine all these different fried dishes and such. It doesn't mean fried at all. Tempura is, is from Latin time. It's called because that's the food you eat in those different times. And there was actually mm. so many even dishes that the Portuguese and and Spanish would would make as well that really gained in popularity in Japan. And this was long before, uh, uh, you know, the Japanese uh, really outlaw Christianity. And you know, you were forced out or you were executed. And that was in the late 1500s. We have Saint Paul Miki and others crucified there. Christianity, you know, outlawed. It wasn't until the 1870s. The Christianity would became legally uh, allowed to return to Japan, and the Christians who came back, and the missionaries who found the Christians who had still persevered in the faith all these centuries, who kept it alive, um, were still keeping these fast days and still keeping these absence days, and still referred to these as tempura dishes from these different seasons throughout the year. So Ember Days has a long history, as I mentioned very early on when we started talking. They go back at least to Pope Callistus in the 200s. And while the date of them somewhat changed a little bit over time, sometimes they would be announced, you know, the Lever mentions that too. You know, we know by Pope St. Gregory the Great in 601, that's when he died. They were observed in four different seasons throughout the year. But we know for sure in 1078, the Roman Synod of that year established them under Gregory the Seventh that they would occur at the dates they occur now. So the dates that we know as the Ember Days are definitely the dates that go back at least to 1078. But the Ember Days themselves, likely, as St. Leo mentions, go back to the very beginning of Christianity with the apostles. Yeah, the uh, um, we need another Pope Gregory. The Gregories were such great popes. <laughs> um, there was, oh, I wanted to ask Aaron. I guess I could ask him off air. I want to know if his Protestant tradition had Lent. Because there are some Protestant traditions that do have Lent, but I'm not sure what tradition he comes from. Um, Matthew, this was awesome, man. This was such a such a informative episode. I want to I want to maybe figure out something else to do with you too, and maybe do, do Thank you. something. Well, so I'm glad to glad to meet you, see you guys again, and, and chat. We, I mean, I saw you walk by a couple times at the conference. Always good to chat with you. That was such a busy conference, but so good. Oh so man, people, such a but... that was that was such a good conference, man. I had such a good time talking to everybody and meeting everybody. I hope that and there were so many great hey. people. There and everything but i mean literally every i did not have probably two or three minutes to myself where somebody else wanted to talk especially after you give a talk and yeah. you know, i'm happy to talk to people um but I'm, i mean it was good but if great to be on great to share some insights that i've learned and hopefully continue and people if you learn something share it so this knowledge doesn't die away again but yeah. you know if, if you are interested you know my book the definitive guide to catholic fasting and absence this is the first edition here Second edition will be published next year. But I even have priests, well not known traditional priests, say 95% of this book was new to them, that they did wow. not know. It's not taught in seminaries. And, and Rob, make sure we post his website again. Um, and if we yep. can, the link to his telegram, if anybody wants to join that telegram. Um, Rob, you want to read the two reviews before we get off? Uh, I'll try if as long as the mic doesn't get moved too much. <laughs> Iggy's okay, funny. let me let me sh Iggy loves to crash the party. <laughs> Rob, Rob's uh, Rob's kids love it. All right, so let's see. Uh, where's the newest? The best part of this podcast is the un unsubscribe <laughs> button. Don't waste your time on these low lives. Five <laughs> stars. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay. Uh, everyone, everyone, everyone should avoid AB. At first, I thought this was a joke podcast, but I'm starting to think these dudes actually think the church still has. Oh, come on. Rob has said he went to mass multiple times, and Anthony mentioned going to confession. I'm confused. These apostates need to repent and make a perfect act of contrition if they want to remain part of the remnant underground, invisible American church. But actually, I love the show. I will pray for you all five stars. So, Matt, what we do is we tell people to write a, a a horrible review, but leave five stars for the algorithm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so those are the two latest. Those are the two latest reviews, guys. If you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, we will read it on the show. We hope you make fun of us. We hope you make it funny, and 
The goal is to get us to laugh. Matthew, I'm so glad you came on with us, man. This is very awesome. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we will uh, we'll post links to your uh, latest book. We'll post links to your website. We'll, we'll hook everybody up in the comments. So if you caught this show on a replay, we'll put everything up in the comments. Uh, is there anything else we're missing, Matt? Nope. Just, uh, you know, as I say, like uh, you can learn a lot about fasting, but if you don't practice it, it's really worthless. So like the same thing with the faith, you can learn it a lot, but if you don't actually put it in practice, you know, it just draws. So yeah. hopefully you learned something today, but go out and practice it. No meat any Friday ever, Sunday mass every Sunday. Try even no meat on some Saturdays and you'll see what it does to you to experience that every single week. You actually feel like you are living, you know, a liturgical life more. That's the thing, right? So Mrs. Homemaker said she's allergic to fish. I would say try to do falafel. That's a great substitute. And remember, fish was added as an exception really under the time of Gregory the Great. I mean, yeah. try to be vegan is really what the early church was. So, so you don't have to have fish. A, living a liturgical life is such an awesome thing to do as a Catholic. And 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 if you learn to, to pattern your life on the liturgical calendar, it actually will because then it's not just mass on Sundays. You're actually learning to to move to the rhythms that the church over 2,000 years has shown, proven to be a way to make saints. I mean, that's yeah. really what it is. So, yeah, if you guys can, let's. Um, I mean, if you guys don't already abstain from meat on Fridays, that's the minimum. Come on. Everybody should be abstaining from meat on Fridays. I don't care for the exceptions they made in recent times. Let's all get doing this. Because we are going to have to stand before our Lord one day and we will be held to account for the things we were unwilling to give up. So, yeah. And I would say try to add another days too. Add on Saturdays, Wednesdays and offer it up for people like Bishop Strickland and our priests. You know, make yeah. it a state of grace. You can offer it up. Try to do that next week. I'm offering up my cigarettes to Aaron's conversion and Shelly's conversion. <laughs> and my father's man my father i need my father to come back to mass there's so many people in my life i'm gonna start fasting for all these people matthew thank you so much man rob take us out brother iggy don't touch stop it ah! <laughs> welcome sorry to okay here we go <laughs> <laughs>